Hello, and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979. Today, we continue our journey through our NAND to Tetris course. We'll be looking at sequential logic, or to put it more simply, RAM and computer memory. Before we begin, let me remind you this is part of a series, and you might want to start at the first episode of this series. If so, click on the card. The question that inspired me is, do computers really think in zeros and ones? And we wanted to take a look at the lowest levels of computer architecture and build them up into a programming language. I should say, I'm not sponsored by anyone here. I'm just using the NAND to Tetris course as a framework because I love it. If you want to know about the tools we're using so you can set them up on your computer and follow along, make sure to take a look at the setup video, which covers exactly what you'll need to download and install. For this week's topic, all of the assignments you'll be working on can be found in the Projects 03 directory of the NAND to Tetris course materials. There are two subdirectories there, A and B. First do the assignments in A, then do the assignments in B. As always, focus on the .hdl files. You'll use those along with the .tst test cases in the hardware simulator to check your work. Every circuit we've built thus far has been combinatorial. This means that those circuits have no concept of time. They can produce an answer, but they can't maintain any state. They can't remember anything. So what does it mean for a computer to remember something? Well, to remember something now, it must have been committed to memory at some time in the past. Thus, to remember information, we need some way to represent the passage of time. Most computers represent the passage of time with an oscillator that constantly delivers an alternating signal. We label this zero or one, low or high, tick or talk. We call the elapsed time between the beginning of a tick and the ending of the following talk a clock cycle. Each clock cycle represents one time unit. Every sequential chip on the computer is synchronized to this clock cycle. Synchronization is needed because in order to remember things over time, we're going to have chips whose input is potentially their own output. In a large system, any change in state can cause a cascade where signals are unstable and you can't trust their values. We can call this a metastable state. The clock speed on a CPU is chosen in part to represent a period of time that is long enough for those signals to become stable. The most basic sequential unit in a computer is a flip-flop. In this case, we're using a provided flip-flop called a data flip-flop, or a DFF. To reduce the DFF's behavior to a formula, it would be out of t equals in of t minus 1. In other words, we can view the DFF as delaying or holding a signal for one clock cycle. Some people would call this type of circuit a latch. We don't have to build a DFF for this class since it's been given to us as an elementary part. But for those of you who are curious about what it looks like, I threw together an example schematic. Here it is. The thing to note here is that the in value, D, is changing but the out value, Q, does not change until the clock advances. Given a latch, we can build all of the more complex memory storages we need, and that's what you'll be doing this week. Specifically, we'll be building a single-bit register, a 16-bit register composed of many single-bit registers, and then larger banks of memory composed of these smaller pieces. We'll also build a program counter that our computer will use to decide what instruction to execute next. You've got essentially three challenges this week spread across a number of chips. Self-referential circuits, addressing RAM within a memory bank, and composing small registers into larger data banks. The creation of the self-referential circuit is entirely contained within the bit task. Although our larger memory banks do in fact have a self-referential property, creating and then using the bit component is going to treat this as an abstraction and essentially hide it from those higher levels. So the main challenge of BIT is understanding how do you design this in a way that allows you to load new data into the circuit while still allowing you to persist the old value that's already in the circuit when new data is not being loaded. 
As you create larger components from the bit, you're going to encounter the challenge of how do you refer to the specific memory you've created? In other words, how do you address that memory? Whether you're reading it or writing it, you have to address it. I suggest going back to lab 4A and looking at our four-way and eight-way multiplexers. Ask yourself, are there patterns you used in those implementations that might help you out here? Lastly, combining these chips into large memory banks will create more opportunities to confuse yourself and make mistakes. Think about ways to keep your story straight while writing your HDL. If you have questions about this week's exercises, please put them in the comments below. And if you like this series, please help spread the word and bring new people to the class. And don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. I'll see you in about a week to work through the exercises in the lab. This has been programming like it's 1979. Thanks for watching.